Hi, everybody. Uh, Bob Myers here. I am delighted to welcome Ron Destro, uh, a distinguished uh, stage director, um, actor, and the author of the book over his right shoulder, uh, Star, the Moon, and the Sun. I can hold it up too, but... <laughs> Mine's not blurry. <laughs> it's blurry. So what I want to do first with Ron is get a sense of his background uh, in the theater and uh, then um, go into the book. Um, and, uh, which I, I must say, I must tell everyone I love, it's really terrific. Um, so if you don't have it on the shelf, run out and buy it or, or order it. So Ron, thank you for joining us. Um, oh, my pleasure. thank you, Bob, for asking. Sure. So, uh, let's start off with the, um, uh, the plays, the production and this unique, um, uh, format you have of seeking, I assume whenever possible, going over to England or wherever uh, to deal with actors in the native environment. Why don't you talk about that, please? Oh, okay. Well, uh, for many years now, we've been, I created the nonprofit Oxford Shakespeare Company. And uh, it was designed to take actors from all over the world and uh, present a full Shakespeare play in its historic environment or other interesting environments. So we have done, for example, Hamlet in Elsinore, and uh, we did Richard III on Bosworth Field, mm. and the fifth on the Field of Agincourt. I think we were the first ones ever to perform there. And uh, we like to do Macbeth in Burnham Wood in front of Burnham Oak, which is the last remaining thousand year old Oak tree. Really? Really? Interesting. Rain, yeah, King Macbeth actually reigned. So, okay. so uh, and I started it because I wanted to give particularly uh, young actors a chance to experience what I experienced in my, I did a one year American program at RADA uh, with Marymount College. And wait, RADA is? It's the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art. Got it. Thank you. At the time was considered the best Shakespeare training in the world. Yes. And uh, so I was there for a year and it was the, the most informative, brilliant year of my life. Uh, I learned so much there in one year that I want to give young actors a chance to experience that. So when we go over there, I hire actually some of my old <laughs> people from RADA to teach them in a, in a 10 day workshop the mm -hmm. actors come memorized and we meet at a certain location. We, I rehearse them and Malcolm Mackay or someone like that will teach them as he taught at RADA. And then at the end of the week, we perform a couple of performances of the play in the historic location. The last one we did actually was um, All's Well That Ends Well at uh, Heddingham Castle. Oh, wow. I thought that was appropriate. That's great. That's <laughs> great. How long have you been doing that? Well, I've been taking actors overseas for about 15 years, and I've been acting and directing and writing plays uh, for about 60 years. <laughs> Very, impressive. Very impressive. Very impressive. <laughs> All right. So... Um, uh, I see uh, the uh, uh, Devere shield over your left shoulder. Oh, yes. Um, and uh, the book over your right, I see a, a, a skull that could well be Yorick. Um, uh, uh, lots of things. Um, how did you get interested in the um, uh, Oxfordian issue? Well, uh, about... I don't know, 20 or 25 years ago, I was taking a class at Columbia University with Kristen Linkletter, who is considered one of the great voice teachers in theater. Mm -hmm. And uh, Kristen was doing a summer class on Shakespeare. So I immediately signed up for it and uh, read her book called Freeing Shakespeare's Voice. Uh, in the book, she talks about the... Uh, Oxfordian theory. She was an Oxfordian. And so I was interested. I had always heard there were questions about who Shakespeare was and didn't know much about it. So 
in working with Kristen that summer, she said, well, if you're interested, uh, you know, you could take a look at uh, Richard Whalen's book or the Ogburn book and so forth, and which I did. And I immediately became obsessed with who was Shakespeare. <laughs> so I quit life for five years. <laughs> yeah. Did nothing but research it. Uh, yeah alone in the woods with the deer and the ducks and my wife in Connecticut and, and just came to the conclusion very early on that Kristen and all the other great performers and writers uh, who've studied this are correct in that it, the Earl of Oxford seems to be our man. Yeah. <laughs> so how do we translate that interest um, into uh, creating and writing a novel? A lot of my wonderful friends and colleagues have written these beautiful books, you know, from Hank Whittemore to uh, Roger Strip Matter and, and uh, Bobby Brazil, all these wonderful people have written the ultimate books, I think, on the argument. So I decided I wanted to uh, interest a wider general audience. And the best way to do that would be a novel. However, I wanted to make it interesting. So it had to be an Elizabethan murder mystery. And so <laughs> primarily my book is an Elizabethan murder mystery. Uh -huh. A young man sets out to find out why his printer father was taken in the middle of the night by King James and executed for uh, attempting to publish an anonymous pamphlet about Shakespeare. And he doesn't know why. Why would this cause his father his life? Why would King James be so upset at what the story might reveal. So first and foremost, I wanted to write a murder mystery. I'm, most of my writing has been as a playwright. So, you know, I, I try to tell a good tale. And that was my objective in, in the star, the moon, the sun, to tell a good story and, with a lot of twists and turns. And that the solving of the mystery just happens to reveal who the real Shakespeare was. Who would have thunk it? Who um, uh, so your approach has been recognized by uh, various um, groups that judge these things. You've had a number of recent awards, I think. Uh, uh, historical novel or fiction. Why don't you tell us about those? Oh, yeah. Well, I'm, I'm really thrilled that there has been uh, recognition among the uh, novel people who the contests and book contests and yeah. so so uh, I did receive a few awards. Um, most recently, the uh, 2023 book of the year. I was uh, this book was second runner up and received an award for that. We also received the gold medal for best audiobook in historical fiction, uh, best new author at my age. Uh, but it's my it's my first novel. So uh, uh -huh. so I am considered best new new author <laughs> <laughs> and uh, received uh, I'm on I was shortlisted uh, for the Flash 500 novel opening competition, long listed for the Chanticleer Mystery and Mayhem Awards. And so we're really? still we're still a few of the juries are still out. So we're hoping to get a couple of more nods. And of course, the audiobook, I'm not surprised the audiobook has received acclaim because it was uh, narrated by my hero, uh, a man I consider the greatest living Shakespearean actor, Sir Derek Jacoby. Yeah, you can't, I mean, it's, uh, uh, I would look forward to hearing it um, just to hear him. And in fact, uh, I may well get the audio uh, version for my car, which is. Oh, uh, wow. <laughs> uh, where, where I tend to listen to these things. Um, so one of the things I thought was really terrific in the book was you can be innocently turning a page and discover that a name from the 20th or 21st century pops out at you as someone who was actively engaged in the issue back in the uh, 16th century. Um Ogborn, Strip Matter, I mean, they pop up as, as experts who are not fooled. Um, how did you work that in? Uh, or when did you decide to do that, I guess? Well, uh, the, being a novel, 
that moves from place to place and covers many years, there are a lot of characters. And so I thought, well, why don't I take some of the, the wonderful modern researchers, people that I know, and sort of give them a, a nod? Because as it says it, it, in the acknowledgments, I, this, this book is written because I stand on the shoulders of giants. A lot of the people I've already mentioned have done the heavy lifting. And right. so, so I wanted to create characters, giving them uh, uh, sort of an homage. So there is a, a John Loney, a Professor Ogburn, but there's also a master strip master. Uh, and there is, uh, you know, the, uh, John, Johnny Rollett. And so many I people- I thought that was cute. I Pardon? thought that was cute, yeah. Oh, good, good. I, I, I think John uh, would appreciate it, I hope. But, um, but, so, so I wanted to acknowledge the best way I could. There are also a lot of Easter eggs sort of in the book, if you will. For example, one of them that I'm most proud of, and, and it doesn't necessarily relate to the authorship, but um, the, when they talk about rebuilding the Globe Theater after they dismantle it and build it uh, down in uh, South Bank, um, there was a, I wanted to give Sam Wanamaker a nod because Sam was an American actor who is responsible for rebuilding the theater. So yeah. there's some, something in there that uh, Thomas Brand was the actual builder of the, the new globe uh, back in the day, uh, the old globe, I should call it. And uh, so uh, I say that uh, there, was, it was, there were two brothers, Thomas and Samuel Brand, and they they were in charge of rebuilding the globe and Thomas wanted a maker to build it in the style of the new, whereas Sam wanted a maker to build it in the, so, so little, <laughs> little inside jokes and, uh, that's uh, fun. Word play. Um, did you, you go to England a lot for the play productions. Did you do research for this book that was separate from the uh, uh, plays you produce? Um, I, I have been there a lot and uh, I don't recall, I didn't go there specifically to research the okay. book, but it's based on my knowledge of London and Stratford. I, uh, in, in the description of Stratford, when we talk about Will Shakespeare and his adventures, um, I, I know very well the streets and where New Place was located and where the church is located. So I relied on my memory for that, mm -hmm. uh, as well as in London and, and Cheap, Cheapside and all of this. So, but I did a lot of research and I brought up as many old maps of London as possible. Really? So that I knew that I, that I knew where every street was so that I knew if one character was going from Blackfriars to uh, to another location to the tower, I knew what streets he had to take. Mm -hmm. And um, I also researched very carefully. I wanted the book to be understood clearly by a modern ear someone maybe who is not familiar with Shakespeare at all and not familiar with the period, but I wanted to use period language, however, make it so that it was understandable today. And so I relied heavily on the Oxford mm -hmm. Dictionary mm -hmm. because I didn't want to throw in any words that were not contemporary, but, I, but were understood today. So that was important for me. Um. Um, when you were doing your research or sketching out your chapters, mm -hmm. did anything come up that was sort of an aha moment? And you said, wait a minute, I knew this, but if I look at it the right way, it's actually this. Um, anything like that? Um, I, it's funny because I had originally written this basic story about 20 years ago as a screenplay and there was interest oh. in it and people wanted to produce it and so forth but it was just about the time that anonymous was also being prepared so they said you know what tom hanks owns anonymous so you're uh. this, this most likely won't get done because of the other work so let's put it on hold so i put it on hold for 20 years and uh the the thing that dawned on me as i decided to 
during uh, around COVID, I decided, well, I'm going to take this out of mothballs and maybe I'll novelize it and then approach Hollywood again. And so uh, I started writing it. And this time the focus was very different because number one, we were going through COVID. And so the, the uh, idea of the plague is an important one in the story of a couple of the characters in this book. And so uh, what we were going through informed me a little better on what they had gone through with the plague. And so that the book doesn't dwell on the plague, but there are just a couple of pages where it's kind of important. And I want it to be as accurate as possible. And I wanted modern readers to relate. So that was interesting. But the most important part of the story that changed from my original conceptions had to do with being a father, because this is a story very much in my eyes about fathers and sons and sacrifice. Uh, and in the, in the intervening years between having written the screenplay years ago and today, I've become a father. So I have a thank you. I have a wonderful teenage son, and it's been the most important aspect of my life and the greatest joy of my life. And so I could... Uh, use that feeling of father to son in the book. So it's very much a book about fathers and sons. Mm -hmm. uh, that comes across, and it's one of the right. warmer, nicer uh, feelings in the book. Um, By the way, there was also yeah. just just there was also in researching the period, I came across the story of young actors, young boys who were being taken off the street and being put into service for Her Majesty as, as a chorister. And so the story in the book, I decided to use it in the book. So the story about the young boy who's taken and his father is desperate to get his son back, um, that's all a true story. And he sues wow. the crown. He actually did sue the crown to get his boy back. So all of that is it really happened. So that was part of the interesting research. See, that's that's really great stuff to know because I'd never heard that. Mm -hmm. um, and one sort of wonders, well, where do they get the kids? Where do they get the boys? Um, and you added a very darker element to that story based on fact. They yeah. were kidnapped. They were yeah. kidnapped. Yeah. How long did the um, research and then the writing take for this uh, book? Well... The research, I guess the research has been taking 25 years since Kristen. Yeah, okay. So I'll that, buy. you know, that's that's the research. But the it's it's funny. Um, so it it probably took me a year or two to write the original screenplay, but this new version is drastically different, as I mentioned, because of mm -hmm. being a father, but also it's different because I discovered the narrator Arthur Taverner who was not part of the original film script. Uh, so having Arthur, Ar I, it's funny because I pictured Derek Jacobi as uh, Arthur when mm -hmm. I was, and so, uh, and he's a kind of Falstaffian character. He's very fun. He's very funny. You know, he's this sort of portly drunken poet who sees life in a particular way. Yeah. And I thought it would be a fun voice to listen to throughout the book. And so, um, so that was a, a very important uh, change. And once I had his voice, it, it took a year to write. It was very easy to write. It almost just came yeah. to me. Yeah. I was, you know how writers say I was just the instrument and it was just flowing. So uh, it took about a year to write and then it took about a year to get an agent for it. And, um, and we got several publishers interested, and and there you go. Um, uh, did you encounter more or less um, skepticism from agents or publishers uh, um, who basically were saying, no, it's Shakespeare, it's not anybody else, um, right. I don't want to go there? Well, I didn't get specifics as to why it, I was re being rejected. You know, it was just 
uh, sorry, this, this is just not quite for us. So I never really got anything specific. Mm-hmm. And, uh, but I'm sure the idea of it being about Shakespeare and an, an authorship question did scare some people off. But um, it was funny that I got, uh, I think, three or four offers from small publishers mm-hmm. to publish it. The sticking point was the audiobook because a lot of them did not want to uh, be involved in the expense of having a big star. You know, I mean, that, that an audio book can be done pretty cheaply, but when you have a star do it, yeah. it becomes more expensive, obviously. So that was the sticking point. And I, so I ultimately went with uh, the publisher who said, uh, no, you, you know, if you, if you want to, do the audiobook that's fine with us and and uh so so i that was uh th- i i was very adamant about having the audiobook as part of the deal because i think that was important to have derek cool. do that. Yeah. yeah and i was very lucky that he liked the book i first had approached him uh, i'd sort of known him on and off for years because my first book the shakespeare master classes is a series of uh classes with artists and Derek did two classes with us, one in London and one in New York. So I've known him on and off for years. And I sent him this a draft of the book and I said, would you mind reading it just to give me a book blurb? And he, he liked it a lot and gave me a very nice blurb. And then I felt emboldened to say, could I talk to your agent about you doing the audio book? What do you think of that? And he said, sure, go ahead. I'd love to. Very <laughs> nice. um, l- let me go back to your directing people, uh, actors, uh, in England, in a location associated with the play, are is there a way that you seek to find an Oxfordian approach to those moments, or um, is it the text and how they handle the text? Um, <clears throat> and it is is it even possible to find an Oxfordian moment in the text when you're working with actors like that? Yeah, it's it it is difficult because, um, and I all the, I always tell them in the first rehearsal I say, look, some of you know I'm an Oxfordian. Uh, this is, and these are a few points that I think are important to consider in this play. I think this is like if we do Hamlet, I will talk to them uh, uh, about the autobiographical nature of the play. In yeah. my opinion, but I don't spend a lot of time on it. And I say, look. Um, this is my opinion. It's not, it's not a cult. You don't have to join. That's all right. <laughs> Uh, let's have fun, but it it helps to explain moments that are hard to understand. Yeah. So I think, and I've asked actors like Derek Jagby and Michael York and uh, Jeremy Irons, who are Oxfordians or who, I asked Jeremy if he was an Oxfordian. He said, well, I sometimes veer that way. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, and I, I've asked them the question, which is, does it matter who wrote the plays when you're acting the plays. And they all say no, because you're playing the character in the context of the play, so we're doing the the, the play. Uh, however, I think it, in, it informs a director. And when I was doing uh, All's Weather That Ends Well at Castle Headingham, where Oxford grew up, and, it, and I think a lot of the story is set there, It was helpful for me because, for example, everyone talks about it being a problem play. I don't understand why he gets together with her at the end and everyone's happy. Well, I believe he's not happy at the end and he's he's being sarcastic. Yes, I'll take her hand. Everything's fine. And so when I stage the moment at the very end and usually the, the king goes off and with the countess and then the other someone else goes off and at the end, Bertram and Helena go off happily together and follow them. I have him sort of lead her, sort of follow. He, he gives a hand gesture saying, follow the king and you please go first. And she goes. He sees the young woman that he's interested in. I forget her name, but she goes off the other way and uh, that he thought he was sleeping with, you know, and uh, she goes off a different way. I have him follow her instead of his wife. Nice. So, so it's and that was informed by with Anne Cecil. Right. So you moments like that, but 
it, it's not really clear to the audience. Once I directed a production of Twelfth Night at uh, Sam Houston State University, and I had a sort of a prologue where we did it in a Liz- Elizabethan close. They transferred the theater, a black box. They built a mini globe theater, and we had students standing as groundlings. So to start the play, I had some of my student actors come out wearing Elizabethan clothes as Elizabethan groundlings. And they started talking about the play and they'd say, oh, do you hear he's ridiculing uh, Sir Christopher Hatton as this one? And then he's doing this and this. So they give some of the Oxfordian glossing to help help the audience understand Oh, do you hear? I think he's got the uh, Queen Elizabeth sort of portrayed on the stage as yeah, the Sylvia yeah. here. So they give a little bit of it away uh, in the prologue, and then the trumpet comes out, and they they be quiet, and the play starts. So you can do you can get away with it by doing that, but it's hard to uh, to do it any other way. When we perform in New York uh, at the Oxford Shakespeare Company. For years, we had our own little theater downtown. And uh, in the program, I would have notes saying, these are the Oxfordian moments in the play. So the audience could read all of that before mm. the play. That's, um, that's very interesting. I've discovered in uh, some sort of the, uh, some of the panels I have moderated that there's always a skeptic who asks, what does it matter? Yes. Have the plays, you know, and, and I think if you can say, as I did to this one particular person, uh, I'd just seen The Tempest. I'd read it. I'd seen other versions. Um, this was at uh, uh, in Ashland. I said, it suddenly mattered a great deal to me when Prospero throws his magic wand down, when he says he will give up his library. Yes. That was De Vere. Yes. That was, to me, very moving. So um, it, that extra knowledge worked on the play. Um, let me ask you if there are any Oxfordian or Shakespearean items behind you uh, that you might want to uh, show. I realize with this kind of thing, you can't exactly turn around easily, but I think we're obviously in your study now. Uh, yes. So uh, and it, it looks like a nice place to work. It is. Um, well, whenever whenever we do a master class with a great actor, I ask them to sign a skull of Europe. <laughs> and, uh, and so so I have a lot of these around uh, for, you know, so it's great to have Glenda Jackson or F. Murray Abraham or Derek uh, with their signatures. Uh, it was it was fun. And they'll write, you know, Sir Derek wrote the readiness is all. Or, so, uh, so where are these things? I mean, you just have a shelf where you have all these skulls. Yeah, they're, in, they're in drawers, and <laughs> like yes, they are. But um, the funniest thing was when I asked uh, Frank Langella to sign one. I had mentioned to him before the the workshop. I said, I, "I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you to sign a, a skull." I ask everyone to sign a skull. And uh, and I, I tell them that so that if they want to think maybe ahead what they might want to sign. Yeah. So, uh, so when I gave the skull at the end of the class and I gave the skull, skull to Frank, he looked at it and he saw it was empty. And he said, oh, I thought you have all the actors sign the same skull. And I jokingly said, no, because I can make more money on eBay this way. Oh. <laughs> and he everybody laughed. And then he turned to me and he said, well, uh, what a, what about if I write F U on it? <laughs> and then he and then he he signed it. So um, so we'll never know. <laughs> that is right. That's right. I've got it somewhere. <laughs> um, any plans for uh, a, a sequel, if such is the uh, case, to the Star of the Moon and the Sun? Well, or any other book? It, it's funny because the the narrator. Well, yeah, I'm working on a new novel right now, but it, you know, it's I, I feel I'm missing something because I'm missing Arthur Taverner's voice. I love his voice so much. And uh, Arthur, I thought it'd be funny. Uh, it, I mean, if this is interesting to people and there's enough sold, they might want to do a sequel, in which case I thought a funny sequel would be a book that Arthur mentions he's writing a book 
within the story. And he said, and he says he's only he's gotten as far as the title and the dedication, and the name of the the, the story he's writing, because he's sort of interested in in uh, this uh, woman named Agnes who's an ale keep, and although he likes another ale keep uh, named Peg, but so Arthur. Uh, decides that uh, he, he's going to write this thing, but he's only gotten far as the title. It's called The Troublesome Adventures of Old Agnes of Aylesbury, a joyful romp around the gardens of Cheapside with a beautiful ale keep, keep named Agnes, her noble, courageous, and comely knight, Sir Arthur Drinkwell, accompanied by his young page, Banticle Prickling of Stickleback. So I thought that should be the title of the next. You know, that title just rolls off the tongue. It, it <laughs> does, doesn't it? Um, <laughs> All right, so let's let's make sure people know how to get the book. Um, okay. uh, the publisher is Contempo Publishing, and they okay. are in Australia. All right, but um, if, if people are in America, right, I suggest. I mean, the book is available on Amazon, and and if you're interested in it, what I suggest people to do is they can go to Amazon and read the first couple chapters of it to see if they're if if it's going to be easy to read. And I think when they decide it is, go to rondestro.com and buy the book because I can sign it for you ah. and, and send it to you myself. Okay. So, uh, so, but it is available on Amazon as an ebook and as paperback and audiobook. The audiobook is only available on Amazon, but the ebook and the paperback within the United States are available uh, on my site well, or Tempo site. I have, I didn't, I have my autograph from you. <laughs> uh, Bob, thing to Bob, things are never as they seem all the best. Ron Destro, I don't know if we can see here, but if you want to get a signature uh, like that, do what the man says, order it off his website. He'll sign it for you. And, um, this has been a great interview. I appreciate you taking the time. Terrific. I've enjoyed it. Thank you so much for inviting me, Bob. My pleasure. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.